Brothers and sisters, please open your Bibles to the book of Philemon. Philemon. There's a few ways you can pronounce this. Philemon, Philemon, or Philemon. That tends to be more American. They tend to say Philemon. Philemon. I've always known it as Philemon. Now, it's a very short book. You'll find it in between Titus and Hebrews. We're going to go through the whole book. We can do the entire book, but you would please to know that it's the third shortest book in the Bible. One chapter, 25 verses. It's in between Titus and Hebrews. Philemon, or Philemon. Now this is one of Paul's letters to this guy called Philemon, who was one of the leaders in the church in Colossae. So there's a link here with the, with the uh, epistle to the Colossians. Philemon was one of the leaders in the church in Colossae. So Paul is writing from the prison that he was in in Rome. He's writing from Rome. And he wrote this epistle at the same time as he wrote the book of Colossians. And also Ephesians as well. He's writing this about 62 AD. Now the theme of this little book, Philemon, is forgiveness and reconciliation. That is the main theme of this book. This is why this book appears in the Word of God. This theme is forgiveness and reconciliation. And... He's writing to Philemon concerning this guy called Onesimus. Onesimus. This is the guy that Paul is writing to Philemon about. Now, the name Onesimus in Greek means useful. Useful. That is very significant in this book. The name Onesimus means useful. Onesimus is known as the runaway slave. You may have heard him called that before, the runaway slave. He was once a servant of Philemon, So this shows that Philemon would have been quite a wealthy person in that he had servants working for him and Onesimus was one of his servants. However, what happened was is that Onesimus ended up running away. He fled from Philemon and he ran away to Rome. That's why he's known as a runaway slave, a fugitive. So he's basically on the run, he's fled Philemon and he's gone to Rome. Now, the reason why Onesimus fled isn't recorded in the scriptures. It's hinted at, though, however, in verse 18, which we'll come on to. But the reason isn't specifically recorded. However, scholars are unanimous that the reason that Onesimus fled Philemon is because he stole money. He stole money from from Philemon, beg your pardon, and fled to Rome. That is the reason why he fled. And again, it's hinted at in verse 18. So, let's say you're quite a wealthy person. You have you know, someone working for you, a cleaner, a maid, or a nanny, you know, someone who you've entrusted into your household, basically, and one day you come home, you find that person has fled, and they've also stolen money from you. You'd feel pretty uh, ticked off, wouldn't you? You'd feel pretty grieved. So, Onesimus has stolen this money, he's run away to Rome, but of course, whilst he's in Rome, he bumps into Paul, who was under house arrest at the time. So Paul was under house arrest, that means you're basically chained to a Roman soldier for 24 hours a day. And Onesimus finds Paul in Rome. So he visits Paul, and of course Paul being the preacher that he was, preaches the gospel to to Onesimus and converts him. Onesimus ends up becoming a believer. So this is all the background now to the book of Philemon. Onesimus becomes a believer. He's now a changed man. And because he's a changed man, Paul now wants to send him back to Colossae, to Philemon, for the purpose of the ministry. So this man is no longer the thief he once was. He's now a changed man. He's now a born-again new creation in Christ. And Paul wants to send him back to Colossae to work with Philemon in the ministry. Now, the person who delivered these letters for Paul, namely Colossians, Ephesians, and this epistle to Philemon, this was a guy called Tychicus. Tychicus, this was Paul's... uh, courier you could say he was the one who delivered these letters from Rome to Colossae and Ephesians on the way so he's also got the letter of Ephesians with him so he stops by in in Ephesus on his way to Colossae Ephesus is about 100 miles before Colossae so this guy Tychicus has got with him the letter to the Ephesians which he delivers to Ephesus then the letter to, to the Colossians And also, at the end of the book of Ephesus, this is mentioned, Tychicus is the one who is delivering the letter. So Ephesians 6, 21 to 22, it says that Tychicus is the one who is going to update you with more. So Tychicus has got these letters with him. One to Ephesus, one to Colossians, 
But then he's got this additional letter with him to Philemon, personally. So this is, this is written to one guy. All these other epistles, Colossians, Ephesians, and all Galatians and Thessalonians, they're written to churches. However, this particular epistle is known as a pastoral epistle. It's written to one guy, Philemon. And the reason for this is because he sent Onesimus back with Tychicus. So it's kind of like a, um, a cover letter, if you want. So it tells us this. At the end of the book of Colossians, in Paul's final greetings, at the end of the book of Colossians, chapter 4, verses 7 to 9, it says, Tychicus, a beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. Also with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you now. They will make known to you all the things which are happening here. And this is how the epistle to the Ephesians ends in a similar way as well. So Paul knows that when Tychicus shows up at the Colossian church and when Philemon sees that Onesimus is with him, Onesimus is going to be like, what's he doing here? What's he doing here coming back here? This is why Paul knows, and don't forget in those days there wasn't any text messages. By the way, I'm just going to send Onesimus along with you because he's a changed man now. No, none of that back then. So you're talking hundreds of miles away as well. So he's had to send this, this cover letter along personally for Philemon to explain why Onesimus is now back. This is the whole meaning of this epistle. And basically in this letter, Paul is appealing to Philemon to receive Onesimus back and to forgive him and to reconcile with him. That's the whole theme of this book. Onesimus is now a changed man. He's not the thief he once was. He's now a born again, new creation in Christ. Please forgive him. Please don't hold his mistake against him. This is what Paul is trying to appeal to Philemon for. So we can begin in verse 1. Philemon 1.1 1, 1. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved bro fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier. This is said to be Philemon's wife and Philemon's son. And the church in your house, that's a church in Colossians. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul often says grace and peace to you because grace in Greek is charis, and peace in Hebrew is shalom. Charis is the typical Greek greeting, that's how they greet one another, and of course Shalom is the typical Hebrew greeting. So this is Paul starting his letter off in his typical fashion, grace and peace to you. Verse 4, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have to, toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for all the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have delivered much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. So in verses 4 to 7 here, Paul's kind of buttering him up, you could say. He's kind of like laying some groundwork because if I was going to ask you to do something, which I know the answer is going to be, no way, absolutely no way. If I know that that's the answer that's going to come, then I've got to spend some time buttering you up, haven't I? I've got to lay some groundwork and that's what Paul's doing here in verses 4 to, four to 7. Remember also, according to Roman law, Philemon could have had legal, he could have legally had Onesimus put to death for his crime. So he's got absolutely every right to put this man to death. And this is what Paul is appealing against. Paul's got to lay a lot of groundwork here. But in verse 8, now he's going to come straight to the point. Verse 8. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake I prefer to appeal to you. So he doesn't want to have to order him. He wants to take the nice approach and to ask him. He wants him to do this voluntarily. I, Paul, an old man and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Now, some say that Onesimus was already a believer when he fled. There's two problems with this because Paul says here, I became his father in my imprisonment. So spiritual father. He became his spiritual mentor. He became. And secondly, Paul was never one to give second chances to believers who sinned or backslid. Unbelievers, yes, unbelievers are new creations. But when it came to believers who messed up, Paul was not one to give second chances. In Acts chapter 13, for example, Paul and Barnabas took along Mark, who was Barnabas' nephew. Barnabas, is, Barnabas was Mark's uncle. So he took Mark along as their assistant on their first missionary trip around Europe. This is the same Mark also who wrote the Gospel of Mark. 
But Mark bailed, didn't he? Mark turned back. Halfway through that journey, Mark bailed, he turned back and went back to Jerusalem. He couldn't handle it. Then in Acts 15, on their second missionary journey, they was going to go again and visit some of the churches they'd planted around, around the uh, Roman Empire. Barnabas wanted to take Mark along with him again. But Paul, none of it. He wouldn't have any of it. No, he's not coming with us. He bailed last time, he let us down last time, and he'll do it again. So Paul is not one to give second chances to believers who turn back from their calling. He said he's not coming with us again, he abandoned us last time, he'll do it again. Now ultimately, Paul and Barnabas fell out over this. They went their separate ways, because obviously Barnabas was Mark's uncle, so I would imagine he was probably making a lot of excuses for him, as people do these days with their relatives. So this caused Barnabas and Paul to go their separate ways, and that's why Silas ended up replacing Barnabas on Paul's next missionary trip. Like I say, Barnabas was arguing from emotion and Paul was arguing from the spirit. Paul was being led by the spirit. Barnabas probably made lots of excuses for his nephew, whereas Paul was being led by the spirit. And I always say, we need more Chuck Smiths in the church. Who's heard of Chuck Smith? Very good teacher. Chuck Smith is known for having fired his own son from the ministry. And that's what you call putting God first, isn't it? His own son, not because of sin, but because of doctrinal error. He went into doctrinal error, and this guy fired his own son from the ministry. We need more people like Chuck Smith in the church. We're not going to make excuses for their relatives, don't we? So the idea that Onesimus was already a believer when he stole from, Phil from Philemon, it's an attempt to try and make believers less accountable for their sin, less accountable than unbelievers. Believe it or not, the Bible actually says it's the other way around. Believers are more accountable for their sin than what unbelievers are. The reason for that is because unbelievers don't have a choice in their sin. Unbelievers are still dead in sin and they have to live in slavery to that sinful nature. Whereas we don't. We have the Holy Spirit. We now have a choice in whether we want to be led by the Spirit or led by the flesh. And this is why, according to the Bible, believers are a lot more accountable for their sin than what unbelievers are. Paul wrote one of the harshest verses in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, Verses, 19 to th verses 9 to 13. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or the swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. In other words, you're always going to have immoral, depraved people around you just by being in this world. But now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a one. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those who are inside the church? God will judge those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Are we not to judge others? We're not to judge others, are we? Bible says we are. Bible says we are to judge those inside the church. Judge with righteous judgment, as the Bible says. It's not talking about unbelievers. It's talking about believers, people who claim to be our brethren. So, coming back to Onesimus, if he'd have done this as a believer, there's absolutely no way Paul would have sent him back to Philemon. Paul was not one to give second chances. Now, forgiveness would have still been necessary but certainly not restoration to a position of responsibility. Paul was never one to do this. Let's continue in verse 10. Verse 10. I appeal, sorry, we've done verse 10, didn't we? I appeal to you from my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Verse 11. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and me. And as I said, the name Onesimus means useful. That's what it means in the Greek. He was once useless, but now he is useful. He is now useful to Paul and he is useful to Philemon, the former master who he served and stole from. He is now useful. And here is the typology in the book of Philemon. You are Onesimus. You are him now because you were once useless to God. God could not use you when you did not know him. God could not use you when you was not a new creation. But now you are Onesimus, you are now useful to him. He can now use you. If you are a new creation in Christ, if you are born again, he can now put you to use for the purpose of the ministry. Whereas before, he couldn't use you. When you didn't know Christ, you were useless to God. But now you are Onesimus, useful. And that's the typology in this book. Onesimus is a picture of you. You are a picture of Onesimus. You are useful to God now. 2 Timothy verse... Sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 to 21. 
But in the great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honour and for dishonour. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he shall be a vessel for honour, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. So it's telling us here to be vessels of gold and silver, vessels of gold and silver which are useful. God couldn't use you when you was a child of wrath, but now that you are a child of God, you are very useful to him indeed. He can use you in ways that you didn't even know. He has a very specific purpose and a plan for you now that you are one of his. So verse 12. I appeal to you for my child Unismus. I am sending back, I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might be done by, not be done by compulsion, but of your own accord. So here he wants Philemon's approval. He wants his blessing. He doesn't want to have to force Philemon. He doesn't want to have to order him. He wants him to do this as an act of his own will. He wants Philemon's approval. It's a little bit like when you ask your future father-in-law to ask for his blessing for you to marry his daughter. You're going to do it anyway, aren't you? You're going to go ahead and do it anyway with or without his blessing. But you'd like to have his approval. You'd like to have his blessing. You'd like to have him on your side. And this is how God is with us. He wants us to do things voluntarily. He wants us to give voluntarily. There should be no giving under compulsion. Nothing should be done under compulsion. It should all be by an act of our own free will. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7 says, Let each one give as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And this is why we announce here every week that we do not want anyone to be giving begrudgingly or under compulsion because God says you are basically better off keeping that. You are better off keeping anything that you are not willing to give with a cheerful heart. The Bible says God loves a cheerful giver and therefore you must be willing to give with a cheerful heart. And if you are not, then that means that you shouldn't be giving. You should be getting yourself right with God before you do that. God loves a cheerful giver. And this is how Paul is dealing with Philemon here. He wants it to do, he wants Philemon to act by his own will and not under compulsion. Verse 15. For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. He's saying that maybe this happened for a reason, that God can bring good out of bad. God always brings good out of bad, doesn't he? The fact that one of Philemon's servants has stolen money for him, God is now going to make good out of this. God can always bring good out of bad. Verse 16, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant. Remember, the word there in the Greek is not slave, it's doulos. Doulos in the Greek, it means bondservant. It does not mean slave. The Bible does not condone slavery. No longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So what Paul is asking here, he's asking for more than forgiveness. He's asking Philemon for more than forgiveness. He's saying, you're not going to be treating him as a slave anymore. You're now going to be treating him as a brother in Christ. You are now treating him as a brother. Onesimus used to be working for you, but now he's going to be working with you. Quite a thing to ask, isn't it? This guy who's stolen money from him and fled, he's not just sending him back to forgive, he's sending him back to work with him as a brother in Christ. I'm not just sending you back for reconciliation, I'm sending this guy back to you as a brother in Christ, not to work for you, but to work with you. So Paul is asking here for Philemon to go above and beyond. Why is Paul asking for more than just forgiveness? Because God doesn't just forgive us. It's not just forgiveness that we receive. God goes above and beyond. We don't just receive forgiveness. That's only part of the exchange that takes place. We don't just receive forgiveness. We receive his righteousness as a free gift as well. We don't just receive forgiveness. We receive a gift of righteousness. Again, this is a picture of what God does. God doesn't just go as far as, you know, God doesn't just do the minimum. God goes above and beyond and he just does not forgive us he also gives us righteousness. He also gives us a free gift of righteousness. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. God doesn't just 
give, not give us what we deserve, which is eternal damnation. He doesn't just not give us that, but he gives us what we don't deserve in exchange as well. He gives us what we don't deserve, which is forgiveness and righteousness. He goes above and beyond. And that's exactly why Paul is asking Philemon to go above and beyond. Not just to forgive him, not just to reconcile, but to treat him as a brother in Christ. Again, quite a lot to ask. So Paul is saying here, don't just not give him what he deserves, which is death. Again, according to Roman law, Philemon could have had Onesimus put to death for his crime. So don't just not give him what he deserves, but give him what he doesn't deserve as well, which is brotherhood in Christ. Onesimus does not deserve to be let off the hook. He deserves death for his, for his crime. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. But Paul is saying, don't just not give him what he deserves, but give him what he doesn't deserve, which is brotherhood in Christ. Verse 17. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. Now, this is like a bit of emotional blackmail, isn't it? If you consider me your partner, then you'll do this. You know, women often say, if you love me, if you love me, then you're going to do this for me. You know, a bit of emotional blackmail. This is what Paul's doing here. Now for the best verse in this book, verse 18. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. So what Paul is saying here. Again, this is why I said earlier on that it alludes to this in verse 18. It alludes to the fact that Onesimus stole money. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. Paul is saying if you're worried about the money, if the money's a big deal for you, don't worry, I'll pay it back for him on his behalf. I'll take care of the money. This is known as intercession, substitutionary atonement. And guess what? There's someone who says that about you. There is someone who says that about you. If he or she has wronged you in any way, charge that to my account. Who is it that says that about you? Can you guess? <laughs> Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus makes intercession for you and I on a daily basis. Because when we wrong God, Jesus is there saying, if they have wronged you in any way, charge that to my account. I'll take the punishment for what this person has done. I'll take the punishment for what one of your children has done. That is what Jesus does for us. He is our substitute, intercession, substitutionary atonement. He took your place in that death which you deserve and that I deserve. When he hung on that cross, it should have been us taking that death. The wages of sin is death. Jesus never sinned. In him there was no sin. We were the ones who had sin. And he took our place, substitutionary atonement, intercession. Jesus intercedes for you and I. He says to God the Father, if this person has wronged you in any way, charge that to my account. Isaiah 53, verse 12. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sins of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. He made intercession for us. Romans 8, 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. He is making intercession for us on a daily basis. So can you believe that when you and I mess up, whenever you and I do something wrong, Jesus says to God, charge that to my account. Put that on my account. I will take the punishment for that. That is what Jesus does with you and I on a daily basis. We see this type of intercession all throughout the Bible. This is not just something that we see as a one-off. It's a theme that we see throughout the Bible. In Genesis chapter 44, you have a good example with Benjamin. When um, Joseph's brothers came to visit him, they didn't know who Joseph was. Joseph recognised them, but they didn't recognise Joseph. Joseph had been living in Egypt for many years. Joseph wanted to test them. So when they took their bags of grain with them, Benjamin was the youngest son as well. What Joseph did was he put his own cup in Benjamin's bag, his own silver cup. And then they ran after him and they looked in his bag and they said, well, first of all, they said, whoever has this cup, which has gone missing, whoever has it is going to remain behind here as our prisoner. So they look in Benjamin's bag and there's the cup and therefore Benjamin has to remain behind as the prisoner. So what does Judah do? Judah is also the tribe where Jesus came from. Judah says, let him go free, I will stay behind as your prisoner. Intercession, substitutionary atonement. Because Jacob, the father of all his brothers, they said when, he, when Benjamin returns to him, 
sorry, I beg your pardon, when the brothers return to him and see that Benjamin is not with them, he's going to know that he died and he's going to have a heart attack and he's going to die straight away. Therefore, let this little boy go and I will take his place. That's what Judah did. Again, it's intercession. Judah volunteered to take Benjamin's place, just as Jesus Christ volunteered to take your place and my place on that cross. In Matthew 27, verses 15 to 23, Pilate gave the people a choice, didn't he, to release either Jesus or Barabbas. Now in Luke 23, 19, it tells us that one of the crimes that Barabbas was charged with, one of his crimes that he was charged with was insurrection. That was one of the crimes that Barabbas was being charged with, insurrection. In the beginning of Luke 23, what was one of Jesus' charges? What were they charging him with? Insurrection. Who was the one doing the insurrection? It was Barabbas. Who didn't do any insurrection? Jesus. Who was the one who went free? Barabbas did. And who was the one who was put to death? Jesus was. Jesus was put to death for something he didn't do instead of someone who actually did commit the crime of insurrection. And again, Barabbas is a picture of you. It's a picture of you. You were the one standing there next to Jesus and Pilate was saying, who shall I release? Barabbas. Barabbas went free and Jesus was nailed to the cross in your place. You're the one who should have suffered that death. You're the one who should have been put to death for your sin according to biblical righteousness because the wages of sin is death. But Jesus took that death for you on your behalf. I will take his place. Charge that to my account. That's what Jesus said about you and I. And this is what we see in the book of Philemon, this theme, not just of forgiveness and, recon and reconciliation, but intercession, substitutionary atonement. So you are Barabbas, you are Benjamin. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 14. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands that he set aside, nailing it to the cross. This huge debt that you owed, this huge sin debt which you could never pay, it was cancelled. The judge literally said, wipe that slate clean. That debt is cancelled. You no longer owe that debt because that debt has been paid for you on your behalf. And you can now legally go free. Remember, Jesus, God cannot unrighteously forgive you. God cannot unrighteously forgive you. He cannot just say, forget about it. Don't worry about the fact that you sinned. I'm going to let you off. What judge would say, don't worry. I know you've committed a crime. I know you've murdered someone. I know you've raped someone. But I can see that you want to turn over a new leaf. So we're going to let you off. No judge would do that. The judge would be fired the next day. The judge has to carry out the punishment. The criminal has to be punished. But the punishment was transferred from the criminal to someone else who was not a criminal. Someone else took that punishment for him. And now, because that punishment has been carried out, it hasn't been spared, it's been transferred. Someone else has taken it. The punishment hasn't been spared, it's been transferred to someone else. Because that punishment has now been carried out on someone else on your behalf, the judge can now legally dismiss you. The judge can now legally say, you can go free in a righteous way, not unrighteously. And that's why God had to send his only son to die for your sin. God couldn't just overlook your sin and say, just walk out of this court without any punishment. God had to punish. God is a righteous judge. There is no unrighteousness in him. But he didn't punish you. He punished his own son instead. And that's an awesome God that we serve, that he didn't spare his only son for you and I. Psalm 32, verses 1 to 2. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. God does not impute sin to you anymore. God does not count your sins against you anymore. Why? Because they have been paid for in the blood of Christ. Jesus Christ has taken every punishment for all your sin, every sin in your life, Every sin in my life was laid upon Jesus Christ at that cross and he became sin for us. He became the living embodiment of sin. He was the living embodiment of righteousness but he became the living embodiment of sin 
so that God could not even look at him on the cross. God had to turn his face away from him. God turned his face away from his only son, because it says in Habakkuk, chapter 1, verse 13, that God's eyes are so pure that he cannot even look upon iniquity. And that's why God couldn't even look upon his only son when he was hanging on that cross. He turned his face away, and Jesus said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God could not even look at his only son, because he became sin for you and I. The death that we deserve, he took it instead. Now we have all sinned against God, we've all broken God's holy laws, we have all wronged him, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. But if you've repented, if you're born again, then Jesus Christ has not condemned you, he does not condemn you and he will not condemn you. There is no, con there is no condemnation for anyone who belongs to Jesus Christ, Romans 8.1. There is no condemnation for anyone who is in Christ Jesus. Jesus says, if he or she has wronged you in any way, charge that to my account. Put that on my account. I will take the punishment for that. Let's continue. Verse 19. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me, or even your own self. In other words, Paul is saying, we're not even going to bring up the fact that you owe me. We're not even going to bring up the fact that you owe me. I am going to settle his debt for him on his behalf. If you are worried about the money, I will pay it back. Charge that to my account. Verse 20. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. So again... It's that emotional blackmail again. We talk to children like this sometimes. You talk to them like you're assuming that they're going to do it. You are going to do this, aren't you? Thank you for doing it. You thank them before they've already done it so that you emotionally blackmail them into doing it. And that's kind of what Paul's doing now. He's saying, I know that you're going to obey this. I know that you're going to do more than I ask. A bit like a salesman. A salesman might not say, um, would you like to buy this? But he might say, how many of these can I put you down for? You know, it's kind of like an assumption, isn't it? You know, to, to emotionally blackmail you into the decision. Verse 22. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I'm hoping that through your prayers I'll be graciously given to you. Ephras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends greetings to you, and so do Mark, Aristarchus, and Demas. Now, Demas is one of the ones who turned away from Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10. And Luke, my fellow workers. Now these are the same people who Paul mentions at the book of Colossians in chapter 4 in his final greetings in that book. So again, we see this connection between the book of Philemon and the book of Colossians. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Now as I said, the theme of this book is forgiveness and reconciliation. We see substitutionary atonement as well, intercession. Forgiveness and reconciliation. God doesn't remember your sin anymore because the punishment has been carried out upon his own son. Your sins have been wiped out. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Love keeps no record of wrong. God doesn't keep any record of your wrongs. Jeremiah 31, 34 says that God does not remember your sins anymore. That new covenant is a covenant where I will remember their sins no more. God does not even remember your sins. He keeps no records of wrongs. God is love, the Bible says, and love keeps no record of wrong. God keeps no record of wrong. Your sin has been wiped out. Your sin has been nailed to that cross. And this is why we must be the same. If you're born again, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you take on the nature of God. You receive his righteousness and you take on his nature. And therefore, he commands us to act in accordance with his nature and not our old nature. Whenever we act in our old nature, you are acting in opposition to God. You are acting in accordance with your flesh. God commands us to act in accordance with his nature. He doesn't just, com he doesn't just command this to unsaved people. They're incapable of acting in God's nature. Unsaved people are incapable of acting in accordance with God's nature because they are still of their old nature. They are still of the sinful nature. But God has given us a new nature. This part, part of acting in accordance with God's nature is forgiving those who we don't want to forgive, just as God has forgiven you. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as, Christ, as God in Christ forgave you. Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 13, Therefore, as the elect of God, as God's chosen ones, the elect of God, Holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, 
kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you must also do. Forgive others just as God has forgiven you. We have absolutely no right to withhold forgiveness from others because God did not hold, withhold forgiveness from you. He could have done, but he didn't. And that's why we must go out and do the same if we are going to act in accordance with God's nature. Remember, Peter says that you are now partakers of the divine nature. You have escaped the corruption of this world. We are no longer walking under our old nature. Part of walking in that new nature means forgiving others, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Now, what Paul was asking of Philemon was a lot. It was, wasn't it? Again, imagine if you had someone in your household who was working for you, they stole money, they fled from you, and now they're being sent back to you as a new convert in Christ. And you're not going to just work, they're not going to be working for you anymore, they're going to be working with you. Is that something you could do? Do you think you could do what Philemon was asked to do? It was a lot. What Paul was asking Philemon to do was a lot, but it's nowhere near what God asked his own son to do. Whatever Paul asked Philemon to do, it doesn't even touch what God asked his own son to do by sacrificing his life on that cross in your place and my place. It doesn't even come close. So if you think that you'd have struggled to do what Philemon was asked to do, if you think that is something that you could never have done, then that's something that you should work on because it doesn't even come close to what Jesus Christ did for you, what he was asked to do on your behalf. He doesn't even touch it. He was asked to suffer that punishment. An innocent man, no insurrection, no murder, there was no sin in him. An innocent man took your punishment on your behalf and he went willingly to that cross. And he did this knowing that most of the world would reject him. Again, it always goes that step further. He did this willingly with the foreknowledge that most of the world will hate him. Can you believe that? He didn't just think, you know, this is going to benefit billions and billions and billions of people. No, very, very few are going to benefit from this. Jesus said the way to destruction is broad, but the way to eternal life is narrow, and few will ever find it. Only few people will ever benefit from this horrible death which Jesus suffered on our behalf. But he foreknew that you and I would believe and accept him, and he still did it, even though it says that many will go to destruction, but few will find the path to eternal life. He knew that you and I would repent and accept him, but he still did it for us anyway. He still did it for us anyway, knowing how many few people would accept him. And let me go even a step further. Did you know that even if, even if you was to be the only person on earth who ever accepted Christ, if you was the only one on earth Whoever accepted Christ, and God knew this in advance, he still not would have spared his only son, and Jesus would have still gone to that cross for you, knowing that you was the only one in history who would accept him. Jesus would have been nailed to that cross just for you personally. Charge that to my account. And that's how much he loves you. That's how much he values you. In that if you was the only person on earth who had ever sinned, or the only person on earth who ever believed, Jesus Christ would have still sacrificed his life just for you, just for you personally. So when you think that you're not that valued, when you think that you feel pretty worthless, just remember that Jesus Christ would have sacrificed his life just for you. He'd have been nailed to that cross just for you alone. That's how much he values you. Don't think that you're worthless because Jesus thinks that you are worthy enough to die for. Again, Romans 8, 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. John 5, 24, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has eternal life. He will not come into condemnation, but has already passed from death into life. You will never come into condemnation. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, if you are born again, if you are the new creation that God commands, then you will never come into condemnation for your sin. It has already been poured out upon someone else. Charge that to my account. But for the Christ-hating world, for those who have no place in their heart for the words of Jesus, the Bible says that a fiery judgment awaits them. A fiery judgment awaits anyone who rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ. That fiery judgment is coming to all those who hate him and have no place in their heart for his words. But praise the Lord that you and I, through that sacrifice, have escaped that fiery judgment which we deserve, 
We don't deserve that fiery judgment any less than those people who are heading for it. We deserve it just as much as what they do, but we are not heading for it because we are now heading for a new life the other way, which is that way in heaven. Your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's what we're heading for now, even though we don't deserve it. Just remember that. We don't deserve this life that awaits us. We deserve the condemnation just as much as those who are heading for it. Just as those who are heading for that condemnation, we deserve it just as much as what they do, because we are all sinners. But praise God that by his sacrifice we have been rescued from that, and that our life is now hidden with Christ in God. And I cannot wait. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let us finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, for today. We thank you for bringing us together. We thank you, Lord, for this awesome lesson that we find in, this, in your word, Lord. This lesson of reconciliation, this lesson of forgiveness, but also this lesson, Lord, of what you did for us, the substitutionary atonement, the intercession that you make for us constantly, Lord, when we wrong you, the amount of times that you say, charge that to my account. We thank you, Lord, that our account has now been wiped clean and that you have taken that punishment for our sin. That you, Lord, have, have suffered that death of which we deserve and that in Jesus Christ there was no sin, but that he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. Lord, we thank you for such a precious gift. We thank you, Lord, and let us never take that for granted, that we deserve that condemnation because we were sinners, but we are now transformed into your image. And we are constantly being conformed into the image of your dear Son. Let us proclaim that to others, Lord. Let us go out there and tell others of that good news, that they no longer have to suffer the punishment for sin, that they too can know that freedom from sin, that they too can receive that forgiveness, that their sin can be paid for in the blood of Christ, that they can receive that eternal life which we have, which awaits us, Lord. Let us go out and proclaim that message to others. Give us that boldness, Lord. Give us that um, confidence. Give us that willingness, Lord, to go out into a world where we are not welcome, but to find those lost sheep who do have place in their hearts for your words. And again, Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for these lessons in this word, Lord. I thank you for bringing our brothers and sisters together today, Lord. And Lord, may you give us all an awesome week. We thank you, Lord, again for your love and your goodness towards us. And we thank you above all for your dear son, Yeshua HaMashiach, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus Christ. He is good.